is modeling. Modeling and equation solving. We're going to focus today on modeling. We talk about three different types of models. Numerical, algebraic, and graph. Okay. Um, mathematical model. By definition, a mathematical structure that approximates phenomena for the purpose of studying or predicting behavior. So we're looking at it in three different forms, just different ways to look at data. We're going to start with numerical models, the most basic kind of mathematical model in which numbers are analyzed to gain insights into phenomena. So we're looking at basically tables of numbers, charts, those types of pieces of information. In our first example, Table 1-1 shows the growth of the federal minimum hourly wage from 1955 to 2015. The table also shows the minimum hourly wage adjusted to the purchasing power of $2,015. Answer the following questions. In what five-year period did the actual minimum hourly wage increase the most? Take a peek. You have the chart in front of you. Or maybe you can see mine. Who knows? But thoughts? Nothing fancy. You can eyeball it and pretty much tell. Tanner? 75 to 80. How much did it increase then? Uh, one. Okay. Is that the highest? Nope. Same trick. Okay. Do you have another answer then? <laughs> Not yet? <laughs> okay, so he saw one that increased a dollar. Did you see something, Tyler? Uh, was it like the 2000? Right? No? Oh, okay. Well. Do we have That has to be the one. No, it's not. <laughs> Yes, it is. 2000 what? 10 to 15. That's the same. Not 2010 to 15. What? Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay, guys, this is going to be the easiest question we do all day here. Or maybe the second easiest question. Maybe B is easier. It's all that. But in what five year period? Okay. In what five year period did the actual minimum hourly wage increase the most? What increments do we have here, folks? We've got five-year period increments, yes? Where's the biggest increase? Okay, you can tell pretty easily by kind of eyeballing. What did we finally figure out? 2005 to 2010. Okay. 2005 to 2010 here because we have what kind of increase? 2005 uh, to... Uh, yeah, About a $2 increase, right? $2.10 increase. So what I'm looking for, we're just looking at the data here. I'm not doing anything fancy in this um, first couple of questions here. But from 2005 to 2010 was the um, largest increase. B, in what year did a worker earning the minimum hourly wage enjoy the greatest purchasing power? What do we see there? The greatest purchasing power. What do you see, Tanner? 1970. Okay. 1970 because we had a purchasing power of 974, and I don't think you see anything greater, do you? No. Now, okay, I just wrote 1974 because of 974, 1970. Each. Okay, C. A worker on minimum wage in 1980 was earning nearly twice as much as a worker on minimum wage in 1970. And yet there was great pressure to raise the minimum wage. Why? Are we supposed to guess? Well, I mean, look at the information there. There's information that's supposed to help guide us using the table. What are you thinking, Grace? Uh, power in dollars higher. Higher when? In um, 1970. Okay. So 
1980, we're earning nearly twice as much as what you are in 1970. You go from what? Minimum wage of $1.60 to minimum wage of $3.10. But what happens at the same time? Okay. The purchasing power is going down from $9.74 to $8.89. And it's, you know, it's a general decreasing trend there. While your minimum wage is increasing, your purchasing power is decreasing. And I don't have a specific definition of purchasing power. But think about, you know, the value of a dollar here. Okay, you know, how much, what does a dollar get you type thing? Okay, a dollar back in 1955 versus a dollar today in 2024 candy, does not do the same. Okay, so the idea of purchasing power there. So, um, so why was there pressure to raise the minimum wage? Because the purchasing power was decreasing, even though that minimum hourly wage increased. And that's all I'm going to write there. Is just that purchasing power was decreasing. Even though, I'm going to use that abbreviation, minimum hourly wage increased. I see. I see. Okay. So get the information you need there. And again, this is looking at the table, gathering information. It's numerical model. Nothing fancy on this first one. <laughs> okay. When you're ready, start looking at example two. Table 1.2 shows the fluctuation in the number of commissioned officers on active duty for several years from 1965 through 2015. Is the proportion of female officers increasing over time? So, what are you seeing in, going on in the chart? Start there. Angela? Well, at first, the total starts out like a bigger number in the hundreds, and then slowly it goes down as there are more females. So I don't think it increased over time because the, just the total amount got smaller. So it's basically like the same amount. But what did the females do during that same time that the total was going down? They were going up. The females were going up. And, you know, it's not exactly going up versus going down, but in general, okay, you observe that the total is decreasing, yes? Starts to come back up there at the end, but in general, it's decreasing. During that same time period, the, fem the number of females is increasing. Now, the question is not about the number of females, though, as you notice. It's about the proportion. proportion. So, is the proportion of females increasing over time? <coughs> It probably is. Now, we're going to get specific here, and I'm going to show you how to prove it, okay? But, the, I mean, we can generally look at that and say, yeah, it kind of looks like it is, just based on the fact that females are going up while the totals are going down, okay? But I want to look at this specifically. How would you find proportions? How would you find this proportion that we need? Ratio. Okay, what kind of ratio? One on top, one on bottom. Yep. Reverse that. Okay, just like if we were dividing to find a percent, right? Female, you do the female, the number that we're interested in, divided by the total. Now, we can go through and do that all by hand. We can go through and do it all on the calculator. I want to show you a way that just it's another way to use these calculators. We're going to use it several times in this lesson that you can enter all this data and get all the information at once. OK, so as I said, you need your calculators today So grab your calculator out and follow along. Follow along closely, please. Because I have several steps and this is new type information here. Um, we did talk about. 
In order to find the proportion here, we're going to be doing the females divided by the total number, right? So just kind of keeping that in mind. Okay, we got the calculators ready to go. Okay, I'm going to start. We're going to use some of our statistics options on here, and I'm going to start by having you go into this stat menu. So if you can hit the button stat here. When you hit the button stat and you get in there, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into edit because we have to edit our list. Now, I used my calculator this morning. My calculator has some numbers in the list. I don't want any numbers in the list right now because I need to put my numbers in, right? Or I could use other columns, but. So we have two options here. If you have numbers in a list, you can delete individual numbers using your DEL delete button, or you can clear the column. So if I go up to L2, I do not want to hit delete here. I'll delete L2 altogether, but I can do a clear enter, and I can clear my columns all at once. So now that I have columns, what numbers did we need in here? We need the females, and we need the totals, okay? Honestly, it doesn't matter which technically, as long as you know which is which. But I'm going to suggest that we put the females into L1. And then with that in mind, I'm going to put the totals into L2. If you needed the males, could you put that into a column also? Yeah, you could. Okay, so in L1, I'm going to start by typing my female numbers. It's just hit the 4, enter, and that will take you down. So 4, 6, 5, 7, keep going. What's wrong? <coughs> I'm mauling. Okay, then ask. Because I need you getting your numbers entered. You're already entered. Okay, do a clear enter at the top of the column. You go up into the heading, clear enter. Okay. Your L1's in there and L2's in there. Okay. Do always double check. Make sure. Um, you'll get an error message later on. L1s and L2s, are they the same length? You might recheck, make sure you entered the same numbers or the correct numbers. Okay. Now, if for some reason you don't have an L1 column, that is fixable. Um, I had to go back and review how to do that this morning for one of the calculators that didn't have an L1 column. But you can also just use other columns. Okay. Are we ready for the next piece? We're going to go over here in L3. And as I said, we can do this all at once, where we don't have to do every individual number. Okay, so... We're going to put our answers in L3. So notice I'm going to arrow up to the L3 heading. So you'll notice that my L3 heading is what is dark here now. And in that L3 heading, what I want to type is, well, what do we need to happen? How do we get females divided by total? What column are my females in? That's L1, yes. So we're going to do L1. I guess I didn't. So this was females here. And then L2 was my 
totals, right? In order to do L3, we're going to type in there, we want to do females divided by total, yes? So what are we doing? We're going to do L1 divided by L2. So as I said, I'm up in here, up in L3, where L3 is darkened, that's highlighted. And it, down here, you'll notice it says L3 equals. So I'm going to come down here on my keypad. Do you see L1 and L2 or whatever L's you need? So to get those, they're in blue above my button. So I hit second. So I'm going to do second L1 divided by second L2. And now you see L1 divided by L2 right there in the formula area. And you hit equals and... You should get all your answers at once. Okay. If you're not getting the, the, those, there's a problem. If done correctly, all of our answers should match, yes? Are we getting them? Okay. Does this support our belief? We thought the proportion is rising. Does this support the belief? It does, doesn't it? Okay. Could we turn those into percents if we wanted to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how could we turn them into percents? Multiply by 100, Multiply by 100 yes. <laughs> okay. And we could have put that in that same little formula there. We could put it into L4 if we want a new column and say L3 times 100. Or you can just, you know, easy to eyeball too. Okay. But that is my proportion here in L3. Now, so I have them. I am going to write them down on my paper for proof. So 0 0.0392, 0 0.0417. I did have someone say this morning that their calculator had more decimal places. So that is a possibility. That if, you know, calculator is slightly rounded different. 0556. Oh no, it's going dark. It's going to go from here, I guess. No, I can't go from here. I don't know where it numbers. Point zero eight two four. Point one zero six four. Point one three one nine point one five zero seven one five one five one five nine four one seven seven two and one eight nine nine. Okay, so our question was, is the proportion of female officers increasing over time? And I'm going to say, yes, it is. And I'm going to say, as shown in L3. Okay, and also, as we talked about, we could change each of these into percents, couldn't we? Like that top one being 3.9%. So that list option, being able to put list of numbers into the calculators is, you know, it's a helpful tool. Now, in this scenario, would it have been just as quick or probably quicker to just type all the numbers in by hand and do the division that way? Oh, yeah, it would have. Okay. Um, a, because we didn't know what we were doing, and B, it just, you know, it would be a slight quicker. Now, once you know what you're doing and once you're proficient at it, I'm going to argue that it's nice having that whole column of numbers together, okay, as opposed to it's like every other line on your couch and you have to scroll down. It's nice having that list of numbers there. Okay. Calculators all cooperated eventually, right? So if not, let me know. You can work through the tweaks. Okay. So that was a numerical model. Um, on the back, we're going to look at an algebraic model, and that's just the idea of using formulas, a mathematical model that uses formulas to relate variable quantities associated with the phenomena being studied. 
It can then generate numerical values of unknown quantities by relating them to known quantities. So we're going to do an example on the top back. Pretty easy example. But um, algebraic here. A pizzeria sells a rectangular 18-inch by 24-inch pizza for the same price as its large round pizza. It is 24 inches in diameter. If both pizzas are of the same thickness, which option gives you more pizza for the money? Thoughts on what we're going to do here? What are you thinking? Is the area we want to compare here? They're the same thickness, so we don't have to worry about volume. We don't have to worry about thin crust versus thick crust, and if that's considered more pizza. Okay, we're going to talk about area. Now, here's my thing. You should know these area formulas. As a student who's reached pre-calc, I would say you should know these area formulas. We'll start easy. Let's start with the rectangular pizza. What do you know about the rectangular pizza? <coughs> Really? 18 by 24. So how do I find the area? Uh, multiply them. Okay. Area of a rectangle, length times width. So this is going to be 18 times 24. And calc there says that is what? 432. 432? And that'd be 432 what? Okay, so rectangular pizza, 432 square inches of pizza. Okay, now, what about the round pizza? Okay, so when we talk round pizza, we're talking obviously about a circular pizza and area of a circle is pi r squared that's one you guys should know it really is okay i know i get i know lots of you don't so you're not alone but it's one that you really just need to learn and know pi times radius squared um for the record those of you thinking two pi r two pi r is the circumference two pi r pi d is circumference so Okay, so what are we doing here? Pi times, what's R? Okay, if diameter is 24, radius is 12. So pi times 12 squared. What are you getting? Okay. So, and that was using the pi button, I assume? Did we find the pi button, folks? It's on the right side. Second exponent sign, is that what I remember? Yeah. Um, a second quit will always get you back to the original screen. What? Oh. A second quit is my... Yeah, if you get stuck in something, because sometimes it is hard to get out of things, I always do second and quit, which is right next to the second button. I had, I had to look because I couldn't remember where it was. but Okay. So if you get stuck in something you can't get out, I quit my way out of it. So. Okay. So what was I hearing for? I'm going to say 452.39. Did everyone use the pi button? Yeah. If you didn't use the pi button, I believe you got 452.16. I mean, I would expect you to use the pi button if you have calculator access, okay? So, but 452.39 inches squared. Okay, which option gives you more pizza for the money? Okay, with these specific size dimensions, the round pizza. Get you more for your money, yes? Okay. Our proof is in our work there. So we're going to continue. We're going to 
For this next example, while we start talking about graphical, we're still going to use algebraic. It's kind of a two-part question with this next one. But um, graphical model, of course, is going to be using a graph, a mo math model that gives a visual representation of a numerical model or an algebraic model and gives insight into the relationship between the variable quantities. Okay. Um, our example is about Galileo. Spent a good deal of time rolling balls down inclined planes, carefully recording the distance they traveled as a function of elapsed time. His experiments are commonly repeated in physics classes today. So it is to reproduce a typical table table of Galilean data. data. Now, you have a set of data here to look at. And you have a question, two questions, actually. One question is what graphical model fits the data. And then we're going to be asked to find an algebraic model. In other words, we're going to be asked to write an equation for this stuff. Okay? We can't just jump into writing the equation of this stuff because do we know what these points are doing? Do we know the relationship between them? No, we need to look at these. Now, we could graph these by hand. And we'd want a pretty precise graph to get a specific visual. Or what's the other option? We can graph these on the calculator. And that's what we're going to learn how to do next. So, with that in mind, okay, we have elapsed time in seconds, which normally we talk about time, we talk about being t, correct? And we have a distance traveled, we usually talk about distance being d. However, in terms of when we graph this and we think x and y, out of time and distance, which one is usually our x? Well, that is usually our time, because time is usually your independent variable that does its own thing, and distance is your y, because the distance the ball travels depends on how much time has passed. Okay? Okay. Got the calculators ready to go again? Okay. Go back into your list. Are you still in there or no? If you're not still in there... Go into stat, right? You hit the stat button, and then you go into number one, edit. Now, first things first, our columns are kind of busy, aren't they? So, you have two options. You can delete each individual number. It works using the DEL button. Or what I like to do is I like to clear a column out. So if I go up into the heading L3, and I hit clear, enter, it clears everything out of that column. Mm. Don't delete the column, though. Just clear it. Clear, enter. Clear, enter. And now I have some nice blank columns to use. Yes? Okay. L1. What do we want to put in L1? Mm. Okay. I'm going to put time. Officially, it doesn't matter as long as you know what you have in which column. So if I'm going to put time in L1, which means I'm putting <coughs> distance in L2. So if you would, type those numbers in. L1 is easy because that's just, what, 0 through 8? L2 is my distances. Okay. Always a good thing to check um, is, are your lists equal in length? Okay. If they're equal in length, that gives me a good idea that I entered the correct number of entries. It also doesn't hurt to do a quick check. Does it look like I entered the right numbers? Now, what do we want to see from these numbers? We want to see a graph, graph of the numbers, yes? So to do this, we need to use something called stat plots. 
Now, before I take you to stat plots, I'm going to recommend go to your Y, just your regular Y equals button here. Do you have all of this cleared off? Your Y equals code? Because otherwise they're just going to show up and I don't want them to show up. Okay. Now, I don't know if you guys saw right up there, plot one, plot two, plot three. That is a way to turn your plots on and off. But I'm going to take you a different way for right now because I need you to see how to change settings here. So I'm going to go into stat plot, which is the second function of Y. So I'm going to do second and the Y equals button. And that takes me to stat plots. Yes? More than, like, more than likely, your stat plots are all turned off. We need to turn one of them on. So I'm going to go into plot one. I'm going to hit enter. And first thing I do is on the on, I'm going to hit enter. So now notice on is highlighted. We're going to leave it. We want to see dots. But notice you can also do other things, other types of graphs doing this, OK? Um, important, I don't know, is everyone using L1 and L2? I had someone in my morning class, our L1 was deleted, so they're using L2 and L3, which means they had to change these right here because their numbers were in L2 and L3. If your numbers are in L1 and L2, you're good. Um, you do have the option to change what mark shows up. You also have the option to change the color that it shows up in. Okay, so now we're ready to look at the graph. You can hit graph, or I'm going to do zoom six because I know my settings are wonky. But if you just go to your graph, you should have some dots showing if everything is working correctly. Yes? Okay. Now, can you see all of your points? Probably not. I can see about four of my points. Is that what you can see? Okay. Because we need to talk about the shape of this graph and what all it's doing, I would encourage you to change your settings so that you can see all of the points. And yes, you could zoom out, but then that's going to zoom me way out and it's going to be harder to see. So what I would suggest we do, I'm not sure how comfortable you guys are, but let's go into window and let's change our settings by hand. Okay. I really, when I go into this window screen, I really only focus on X min and max and Y min and max. So right now my X min is set at negative 10. Do I need to see all the way down to negative 10 in my X values? No. Do I have any negative values here? No, my X is only go as low as zero, so I'm actually going to change my X min to zero just because I don't need to see that. X max. How high do my X's go? Eight. 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 So is 10 okay? You can change it to 8 if you want to be specific. I'm going to leave mine at 10. X scale is just what it counts by. I don't usually mess with that. Y min. How low do our Ys need to go? Zero. Zero. Y max. How high do our Ys need to go? At least 48, yes. You can type 48 exactly in there. I'm going to use 50 because it's a nice neat round number. Okay. Now. Next time you don't you go in to grab something and you're like, oh, I have those settings on here, just remember, zoom six, right? That's your zoom standard screen. But for right now, you got everything changed you want to change, hit graph. And now my graph is 0 to 10 on the X and 0 to 50 on the Y. Now, can we see all of our points? Yeah. Thoughts on what we're seeing here? An increase. What graph are we seeing? What shape is this? Do we see a parabola shape? The positive half of it, but parabola shape. Okay, so right there, we're talking about our graphical model, the fact that this is going to be a parabola. Okay. We're going to eventually find an equation for it, but we're talking about the graphical model there. Now, I'm going to write down a few things on here just so we kind of have it. Um, what did we use to do this? We used stat plot. So if you're trying to do something on your own, try and remember what you're doing. Now I'm just going to put a sketch here that. Along my x-axis, it was time, 
and that is time in seconds. Along my y-axis, it is distance, and that is distance in inches. And I'm not doing anything specific, but I'm just going to kind of show that, hey, we have this view. Okay, so you get the parabola view. Okay. And we'll kind of prove ourselves here in a moment if it truly is a parabola. Obviously, I'm going with it. That's what I needed you guys to say. So obviously it is. But we'll have proof here in a little bit when we write this equation and we can graph the equation and see if they match. Okay? So what do you guys know about a parabola, about the equation of a parabola? X squared. Okay, x squared, yes. We generally think y equals x squared. A parabola that's centered at the origin, is that one centered at the origin? Is x squared. Now, what can change that? It's not going to just be, I mean, yes, it's centered at the origin here, but what is different about this? Because we already know if it was centered at the origin, or it is centered at the origin, if it was a normal parabola, it would go through 1, 1. It would go through 2, 4. It would go through 3, 9. Does it go through these numbers? No. So when we talk about this y equals x squared, what we need to think about is what is that a value? You guys know what I mean if I say the a value? Okay. Nope. Okay. So with that in mind, we need to figure out that a value. Okay. That's the key. So general format, y equals ax squared, but we need to figure out what is a. How can we figure out what is a? Could we pick an X and Y and use them to figure out what our A is? Yeah. Now, I will say, because this is in terms of time and distance, instead of using Y equals AX squared, instead of Y, what is Y? Y is our distance. A times, what is X? X is our time. So if we think y equals x squared, or in other words, d equals at squared, what's a good ordered pair we could use to find our a? Zero, zero. I have to disagree with zero, zero. Two, three, three. I like two, three. Now, I'm okay with any ordered pair except zero, zero, because zero, zero is going to do it for us. No. We need something specific to this parabola. So let's put in two, three. That means 2 is going in for T, and 3 is going in for D. So 3 equals A times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4 times A is 4A. What do you know about A? A is 3 fourths. You can express that as 3 fourths, or you could express that as 0.75. So what does that make my equation? If you put this together, my equation, instead of d equals at squared, is going to be d equals 0.75t squared. If you wanted, you could say y equals 0.75x squared. Same idea. Now, you want me to prove that that's correct? I'm going to go into my y equals screen, and I'm going to graph 0.75x squared. I'm not going to change my zoom or anything. I'm just going to go back to my graph screen. And you'll notice, what did my line just do? It just connected all the dots, didn't it? Okay, so the idea that the graphical model that fits that data was the parabola, and then the algebraic model is that d equals 0.75t squared, or y equals 0.75x squared. 
Okay? Okay. That is a good stopping point for today. Um, on Tuesday, we'll talk about example five, where we'll look at a graph of points again to get an idea of what we want to, you know, what we can do there. And then, obviously, the homework's not going to be due on Tuesday because we still have a lot of notes to do.